Ghost Cult Magazine is honored to welcome in Robert Berry. How are you doing, sir? Great to see you again. I am good. It's good to see you again. It's been a, a hell of a couple of years since we talked last, right? I mean, I, I had a tour and then I got went into a black hole, I think, <laughs> right? Right on. I like to call it a leap year. There was no 2020. <laughs> right. Like the 13th floor at a building, it doesn't exist. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, it's been a heavy time. I sincerely hope you're, you've been well, your family, your friend, all your oh, collaborators. I hope man. everybody's okay. I, I, you know, maybe some people are, oh my God, I have lived almost normally. The reason being that I live five minutes away from my studio. I do a lot of singer songwriters, which is one person at a time. So I've been able to do sessions and producing um, all last year. I got to finish the album we're going to talk about because um, I had a little more time than usual. And you know, Campbell, where I'm at, the middle of Silicon Valley here, um, the restaurants outside were mainly open and being a downtown kind of guy and my, my wife and I get to know everybody and we felt safe. We've been out to eat three nights a week, except for when they locked us down. It's, it's almost been normal in in 2020 terms, <laughs> you know, so you can, you can add your own thing to that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been tough, but it's, we've made the most of it because that's all we can do, right? We just keep persisting. That's the human condition, my friend. We just keep yeah. persisting. And uh, I'm, yeah. I'm thankful to hear that you've been well and things have been as normal as could be for you, especially as a working musician. Our whole industry has been crippled and I, I'm sure you had tours planned and live events and gigs. And, you know, uh, I'm sure most of your career, this has probably been, I, I know you're very busy with production and other work, but I'm sure this has probably been the longest you've been home and not on tour in your whole career probably. I have been fortunate and unfortunate because people think I can't keep the job, but <laughs> every couple of years, something else comes up for me that I can do. And I've been on the road a lot. I've had a lot of albums out. I can get along without playing for a year because I play every day in the studio. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I play a lot of instruments, so I'm always doing something for somebody and being creative. But last year was the first time that I got to go and I didn't get to go, but was going to get to go to Europe under my own name and play my history of music all the way from GTR through the Magna Carta stuff, through three, through uh, 3.2 and everything in between. And we did 27 cities in the US and we were gonna actually go out with a big, big train over there. And that was pretty exciting for me because I've actually never played a show in Europe except for at Six Bells with Keith, which was down the pub down the street from his house. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, um, and what a know. show that must have been in a little, in a little, to see Keith and you in a little place must have been a gift. Oh, yeah. He was always fun. He was such a fun guy. I mean, you know, we, we could talk a bit about him, even though he's been gone for a while now. There's just, you know, I feel so fortunate to have been able to work with one of the best there ever was and probably will ever be as good as Jordan Rudis is. I mean, he is really something. But Keith had a little something um new and special he brought to keyboard playing jordan doesn't have the knives down yet and they're throwing the organ on top of himself he'll get there <laughs> he, yeah but he's amazing you know I, oh i've God. been very fortunate to interview and meet jordan several times and he's lovely and wonderful and amazing um and i think yeah. other guys in his band when uh, or the bands that he's in the two big ones uh, I think those guys tend to take on the aspects that Keith had, the showmanship, which is lost a lot in music right now, especially progressive music. But um, yeah, Keith was wonderful. I, it's weird. I really, right before I got ready to do this interview with you, I had just done a huge deep dive with my best friend where we listened to all the ELP records. And I was like a treat for me. And then it was like, oh, and the 3.2 record is coming out. Perfect. Because I have Keith in my mind and uh, a huge, huge fan. And um Right off the bat, and I know that these albums, you bringing three back has been a labor of love for you and a tribute to Keith, of course, you're, you know, it hurts to lose a friend and I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, and we have, we're starting to lose all our heroes, Neil yeah. last year, this time and Eddie Van Halen yeah. and, you know, whoever from that era, we're just losing guys and, uh, and gals. And um, 
but but really like it's such a, a, a it's a, such a tremendous feeling it stirs tremendous feelings to hear this 3.2 record and hear Keith and feel like oh man this is this could have been at any point in his career this stuff is so great you know it it's a little bittersweet for me i i wasn't going to do what i consider the third record in the three series um I had one song I didn't use on the rules of change, which is on this album. You've heard it's called Never. It's almost nine minutes long. And it was in a writing state and it's just sort of rough, you know, had your key stuff and I didn't have all the words and everything, but we, we had worked on it and it, it just was sort of last in line during the rules of change. And when frontiers called me and said, you know, the rules of change did really well. It, we put out a lot of records. You just have to trust us. They wouldn't tell me what, you know, everybody else did. They said, this did really well. You need to do a follow-up. I said, I can't do a follow-up without Keith. They said, you don't have anything else? I said, well, I have one song. They said, well, and it is nine minutes long. It's almost a half an album, you know? And I said, you know, let me see if I could write seven songs that I think, first of all, Keith would want to be involved and work with me on. Second of all, that I feel like is being honest to you know, the parameters that Keith and I laid out for Rules of Change were pretty, not strict, but they were complete because we knew we had done wrong in 1988. We knew what we had done right. We had 27 years of experience to learn. And so we had some really concrete ideas. Let me see if I could fill those in. And they said, oh, okay, get back to us. We want to put it out. I said, I just don't know. So I said, I'm going to write the seven songs first. I actually, like with the last album, divine intervention from Keith, whatever it is, that they just poured out of me in a way that I don't quite understand. I did do a huge press tour of uh, Europe for Rules of Change and got some ideas while I was there for songs and stuff. So the whole London, all that thing was in my mind, like uh, the Devil of Liverpool, the song on there, you know, something I was thinking about. And I started working and it came together. So I said, well, okay. I told myself I'd start to work on Never thinking that it wasn't enough, you know, for the last album. So you know, we'll see what I get out of it. And I don't know, maybe I was just saturated. I, I had a lot of grief, a, a lot of uh, worry about, should I be doing the rules of change? What are people going to think? Are they going to be glad that they to hear Keith's last ever work or anything? Are they going to go, what the hell are you doing? He's gone, you know? But, and of course they, everybody took it really into their hearts. And all of a sudden I, brought never out I'm like oh my god it had such classic Emerson solo section and chords and I went I guess I just missed it because I was a little overwhelmed with everything that I was trying to accomplish to honor him and and of course I mean honor the band that he was half the writer and the sound and I was half the writer and the voice of three so we had all the pieces you know and uh it was also tough for me because, you know, he was sitting on my hard drive with his song, Never. And I, you know, I, it's on my main file where I have all my stuff. And I'd open up sometime, I'd see uh, Double Liverpool and Top of the World, the songs, you know, in the next album. And there at the bottom was Never. And um, he, he was sort of still alive at Sound Tech in the studio. You know, that piece, no one has ever heard that but me, you know. Anyway, you've heard what happened with it, how it all came together. And I, when it was done, got told by my manager, he goes, this could be as big with the Prague fans as Desi Levita is, which is the favorite tune that three has ever done for the real Prague fan. And I really, he goes, yeah, this is gonna stir up some, some talk. I think it's really quite a, a big piece of music. I just missed it, you know? I When we did it in 2015, 16, I, I lose the dates now, but yeah. Right. Well, I think, you know, there's always a possibility that you're very close to the music. You're in the middle of the creative process and you're not really stepping back from it until it's finished, probably because you're in the thick of it. Um, I, yeah. I think anybody that's ever followed your career, I know I have, you've never been a guy, you've always been served the project, served the song, even in your most, you know, expressive, flashy, incredible stuff you've put down musically or vocally. I always feel like you're doing what serves the, the whole better than look at me and look at what I can do. And so, you know, I think your fans know that and appreciate you for that. And, um, yeah. you know, I, 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 you know, I think your heart's in the right place and that's the most important thing. I think it's important for us to keep Keith's 
work alive and keep his memory alive. Um, it you know, was it's important, important to me. He was criticized pretty heavily for the last thing ELP did in, in England. I think it was called, there's some show. And, you know, his arm was sore, of course. He had that operation years ago. And I can remember, because we did a lot of things in between 3 and 3.2 for those uh, 27 years. But he was here and we went to the fish marketplace in Los Gatos to eat right after he had the operation. And he showed me this scar, it's like three inches long and an inch wide. I went, oh my God, and I touched it. I don't know why, he goes, don't touch it. It kind of gave him a shock, you know, no, don't touch it. <laughs> I said, I don't know why I did that, Keith, but it's just so big. I mean, they really dug out his arm, you know? And, but the thing was, he could still play. There's a video of him talking about the Japanese show that's gonna happen just a week before he died, where he's playing. He's got that Casio that, you know, I always, Here's the Casio that I have. It's three hundred fifty dollars. I use it for singers. You're in my studio with me, and I go, "Oh, you're singing flat. It's a you're a little bit flat." And that's all I use it for, except for when Keith and I were working on this, especially over the phone. I'd be I me. Mean, I'd be playing chopsticks, you know, and and he'd be playing, you know, and we try to meet in the middle. <laughs> but he could still play. It, it is my point. And he's obviously he could still create. I mean, if you are even the slightest ELP fan, when you put on a 3.2 album, those solo sections or those chord things, you just know, oh, that's Keith wrote that. I mean, there's no doubt about it. That is, he's one of a kind. He nobody sounds like him. He just has this thing he does, you know. So it's uh it's been a challenge. And I never do think about you know, how good I'm playing or how complicated and but whatever it is, you know, it, it, it does. I try to serve the song. One of the things that I have a hard time with in some progressive music, it, it rambles on aimlessly. And as a musician, I can go, holy shit, wow. But it, my heart and my ears and my memory, when the song's done, it's gone. I go, oh, you know, there was a really great, some great guitar solo, great keyboard playing in there, but I can't even tell you what it is because it's been rambling on for 12 minutes, you know? I try to, I mean, I, you know, I have an AOR slant to my my prog music because it has a chorus usually. It has something you can sing. Even the Devil of Liverpool has a chorus, you know. <laughs> and I just like that. That's just me. And um, where in '88 they held that against Keith, in 2017, whatever they were saying, hey, this is this is good. This is what it should be. Right. Well, what matters most is, you know, obviously your own point of view and your own, you know, you, you make art for yourself. And if people like it, of course, you want fans to like it. You know, they did the same thing with Love Beach after, you know, seven or eight albums and two live albums and a bunch of flawless things uh, and pictures yeah. of an exhibition and things that they did on the spot within like two weeks like that. And then they did Love Beach and people didn't like it. And then, you know, Black Moon was kind of in the middle when they came back. So, you know, it's to say every band kind of has that. Genesis had that. Yes, had that, you know. Right. Um, so, you know. You know, you what's, I got to tell you what's funny. What, what's really funny about that, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, this this will be interesting, I think, to you. When 3 came out, Carl Palmer didn't get criticized at all because he had Asia. And, of right. course, Genesis, like you said, was going that way. Yes, was going that way. Carl had done it, no problem, but Keith hadn't done it. <laughs> and I was the new guy, I didn't care. You're like, hey, let's do, this is great, you know? So what you're saying, you know, they might've made some mistakes. And then again, 30 years later, people are going, I see why they did that, it's not bad, but Keith never got that break. And he, I think would've, with the way the rules of change was accepted and what people thought of it, um, he would've, I don't know, I just, upsets me if he just could have heard what people think of his piece of it you know anyway i'm sorry to interrupt but carl no criticize I thought <laughs> <laughs> right well carl is also kind of like the teflon guy right he's never you know he's so immaculate as a guy and uh, i think he's also put himself out there a little less than probably keith did in terms of the media and the fans and you know, he just kind of shows up and does his thing and you know him well. So, you know, I'm yes. not telling you anything you don't know and I'm just giving my outside opinion, but yeah. yeah, Carl has always been a little more buttoned up and reserved comparatively to Keith and others in the scene, you know, <clears throat> who, uh, you know, if you're too much in the public eye, if you're too much in the critics crosshairs, yeah, yeah. I say that as a, as a long time writer and journalist and, and critic, but, um, you know, sometimes you get 
they pile on. You know, they did it to Carl Phil Collins. Been, yeah, Carl would. Carl would have been on point. Had everything sold, would have made a small profit, and the interview to be done by now. <laughs> yeah, he's a dynamo. He is he worth is. his weight in gold in so many ways in a band. He, I mean, he's one of the all-time great drummers. I watched his drum solo every night on tour. Mm. I didn't go yeah. back to the dressing room. I stood side stage or in the catwalk or something, going, "Oh my god!" You know, and you know he's playing better now and just as loud and as strong than he did back then, 35 years or whatever it's been. Oh my God, he, he really is a powerhouse. Yeah, that's amazing. He's in, uh, incredible, that guy. But let's let's uh, talk a little bit more about the album because uh, I don't okay. want to lose the opportunity to sort of, I, I love Devil of Liverpool. I'm so glad you mentioned it. And uh, obviously Emotional Trigger and Fond Farewell, they're very heavy songs, even you know whether they're meant to be or not. I'm not trying to read too deeply, yeah. but they feel, like you feel the weight of them lyrically, if your performances, um, your vocals have been, um, you know, ama amazing on this record. Uh, and again, I, I, it always seems to me as an outsider, you know, observing your career, every it seems very effortless. Like it seems like whatever you want to do with your toolbox, you can do it. You know, it's, kind it, of an, it's kind interesting. Of one of the things that Keith and I got along so well about is that he always had ideas. I always have ideas. If I had to write a song right now, um, I would go onto my, my phone where I have endless song, at least a title or something, you know, and sometimes I'll put, you know, if I was going to do this, I, I'm trying to find a 3.2. It's way down there. You see all the things. And I don't write complete lyrics. Okay, well, here's Here's where I did a fond farewell, which was the first, you know, it says 3.2 fond farewell. Now, I wrote that about um, kindness. It's, it's, you know, if you and I would have used the F word around our parents when we were little, oh man, well, we wouldn't even say that shit, right? But that just, we were more respectful and everything. Now the F word of my son is like part of, Sammy Hager was that way, but he, you know, he gets away with anything. But my son, it's just part of their vocabulary. So I feel like because of the social media hatred and meanness that's going on, if that becomes the norm in 15 years, it's gonna be like the F word is now. It's gonna be no big deal and say, oh my, we're saying goodbye to kindness. That's what Fallen Farewell is about. But then again, we you read the title, you think, oh, it's the last three albums, it's the third in the series, he's saying goodbye to three and goodbye to Keith. And it works for me that way, but that's not what it's about, you know? So but anyway, the song starts with whatever it is. I always have an idea and I always have a reference to go back to something like, I'll tell you the devil of Liverpool. <laughs> I did that press tour for uh, in London and all the, uh, the press person there had all kinds of people coming in this hotel. They got me a room and they came in for an hour at a time. And it was one of the best things I've ever, had happened PR wise because I was in London. I had my wife Rebecca with me. We saw some sights, but I needed to chill out a little bit. So I said, I just want to do a Beatles taxi cab tour. The tourist thing, the simplest. I just want to know, I don't care to tell me everything I know. We just happened to get this old guy, and he was old, that grew up with George Harrison on the same block. It wasn't like they were buddies, but he knew him, you know. And so, he would talk to us and we'd sort of drive around and we saw the story fields and a few things, but not everything because he was so much more interesting. And he said, you know, when I was young, over here, we were in, in uh, the town of blah, blah, blah. There was this character called the Devil of Liverpool that they always scared us with. He was a loan shark and he was really bad. And he told you know, us the story about it. You know, the devil of Liverpool. Damn, I like that. I wrote that on my phone. It's in there, right? And that's all I wrote was the title. Came back, tried to research the guy, could find very little on him. But I had this story for the taxi cab. Uh, what's the guy that does taxi cab karaoke, the comedian? I forget his name. Uh, James. James Corden. Yep. Yeah, I felt like I had just had a taxi cab with James Gordon and I had all this information. And that came out of it, you know, I, but I always have ideas and it's because I work in the studio every day with somebody, you know, today I, you know, I'm doing something for a guy that had a bad experience at a studio in San Francisco 30 years ago. He has a punk band and the band was really good, but the mix on it was so bad 
that they just sort of threw it in the trash or never listened to it. Well, he had the tapes all transferred. He says, I hear you do, you're really good at mixing and bringing things alive. And, and he said, and fixing vocals, because right? he was all over the place. He goes, we'd like to have these 12 songs mixed. And so I'm, I'm mixing something for this band right now from San Francisco. It's still, it's a little hard on my ears because it really is punk and it's really raunchy. But again, it's my creative side working every day towards something. And I think it, it's not effortless, but it just comes out for some reason. I, I don't know. Nice. Well, you know, again, that could be, uh, I don't know if you compartmentalize like work for yourself and music you're going to create for your own projects versus everything else you do for others. But I imagine having your sort of thumb on and your creative juices going every day, even if they're in different directions, has got to help you when it comes time to do your own stuff. Yeah, yeah. my analytical side, like two plus two, I don't even know what that is anymore. Forget it. That's, that side of my brain's dead. But I will tell you that when it gets to this kind of stuff and, and some of the keyboard solos I've had to do that Keith didn't originally do, I've actually had to play them like just wild, reckless abandonment and then listen and go, God, that has everything I wanted to have except for the right notes. <laughs> and, and I'll go back and at that point, point sort of analyze what I did and then sort of learn it with the right notes. But I can't get into uh, a mode I do like when someone brings a song in and I want to say okay well you, you don't have a hook so we got to get a hook and you don't have an intro let's get you know there's a formula to building a foundation for a singer songwriter song that helps that vocal and lyric get across I try not to do that I might write the song that way but when I'm getting into my own stuff I have to just let it kind of rip and then fix it learn it and fix it nice um, very good. What do you, what do you think is the next logical progression or have you thought about the next move for you? Obviously this record is coming out and we're in a weird time in the world. Hopefully it's going to open back up and you, you can tour again. Um, you know, I know it's just such a, it's just, everything is unknown right now, but like, do you have like the next, you know, what is the plan ultimately to help promote this record? Are you going to be able to tour later this year or next year? We're hoping, you know, I put a great band together, uh, the 3.2, um, that did my whole history. And uh, it's Jimmy Keegan from Spock's Beard. You might know Jimmy. Um, mm -hmm. Andrew Collier from a band called Circuline, who actually grew up with my wife and her brother in a little town called Farmington, Missouri, mm -hmm. and came to me maybe 10 years ago. He goes, he's a doctor now. He goes, well, Robert, I had December people out, my holiday band, you know. And how do you uh, get into this business? I let it go to be a doctor and, you know, goes, I really want to just be a musician. That's what I want to do. I said, you know, another guy really in his forties wants to start now. I'm like, okay, well, I'll tell you, Andrew, what you do is everything. You have to write, you have to sing, you have to play in a band and you have to learn how to market yourself, which I am not good at. I said, but that's what you have to do. If you want to start now, you know, it helps for us guys that have a little bit of a foothold working with some famous guys and having a hit record. We have a little bit of a, a launching point, but it's still not easy. And he goes, oh, <laughs> well, sure enough, the guy did everything. I mean, he is a dynamo. And I, he sent me his CDs for his band and some of the other things. I go, well, God, this guy's really good. And having the mind of a doctor, he could learn all the stuff he did with Keith. He played Desi LaVita. He played Jordan Rudis's version that I did of Carnival 9, if you ever heard that, with Jordan Rudis and Simon Phillips. Oh, my God. Love it. I mean, Jordan Rudis blew me away, but so did Simon Phillips. And Jimmy Keegan, can, he can play that stuff, too. So the band is spectacular. They played all the stuff, GTR music, that no one's ever heard live. And my guitar player that's been with me and my friend, Paul Keller, uh, was in Hush, my college band. And then, you know, for 10 years, we did pretty well but it didn't get big, but he also went on tour with three. So the band was good. Um, I don't know if they're gonna let anybody out for really touring um, this year. I think maybe the small clubs, 150, 250 seats, might be able to get some people in. And just to keep it fresh, you know, I don't care if I play for a hundred people, we might do a few things like that if it's possible. I think a hundred people, will say, oh yeah, I got the vaccine. Oh, I'm safe. I'm, I'm going to go out. 
but 5,000 people are going to say, half of them are going to go, oh, I'm not going to be stuck next to someone, who knows, right? So I think that's going to kill it, even if it is safe. There's too many people that are afraid right now. Um, I, I don't know if it's easing up or not. It seems like things are getting a little bit calmer, but then again, uh, the government's ramping up so many things that, you know, are not moving forward. They're trying to, you know, stay on the path they're on. I, I just wish they'd move forward for right now and give it a few months, then you can deal with all the crap you want to deal with. But let, let's move some forward stuff so we feel good, you know? That's the problem with New York. And I, I know New York well. My publicist for December people, Gail Parento, lives there. And she says, theaters aren't coming back. Hotels aren't coming back because they put so many sick people in them that people are afraid to, to go in there. You know, Broadway's mm. dead. There's not gonna be any shows. It's the rebuilding process for that is going to be huge, right? It's it's more than just a, a 250 seat club is going to have. It, it's a whole lifestyle, I guess. And and she's so sad about it. I thought, oh my god, I just I, we played BB Kings before it closed down with December people. What a great place to play. And Larry Carlton was playing upstairs. Oh my god, I'm like, this is this is where I want to be. I love it down here. They closed before this all happened. But now everything else is just gone, right? So yeah. um, I still think I'm very positive. I think you can tell in my lyrics. Uh, I have a couple of dark ones, like emotional trigger on this. And I'll tell you why that's on here. I wrote that five, six years ago, just because I really like watching the news. And little by little, of course, the news has been really rough on people's psyche. And I wrote it and I played it for Keith. And I sing it in a style with no vibrato and stuff. You know, it's really kind of stark. And I called him, I said, Keith, I'd love for you to do this with me. I, he loves Oscar Peterson, right? A great jazz piano player. I said, God, if you did the keyboards on this. And he, he said, oh, let me listen to it. He called me back. He goes, all right, it's perfect. You don't want to change this. Even your voice, that the no vibrato, that I forget who he said, he compared it to some singer. And he goes, and the piano is just enough. You don't want me to play all over this. I was really hoping to do it with them, you know, but it was something we corresponded and talked about way that was before uh, the rules had changed. I mean, maybe it was 10 years ago we talked about it. So I've had that song sitting there and I thought I'm going to put that on here and see if people think because it's certainly the way of the world right now. The emotional trigger, whichever way you feel and believe it's being pulled, you know, uh, and I also made a conscious decision that this will be the last three album like i said keith was the sound and half the writing i was the voice and half the writing i understand it and know what it is but i can't do it without keith so half this album is moving on toward maybe what i call gtr meets three you know what i did with steve howe and what i did with keith and carl kind of put together because I like the perfect blend of guitar and keyboards. That's, that's my big deal. That's why I loved Asia so much when they came out. So this album does have a bit of that. I'm testing the waters. I want to see if people think. Um, I'm trying to think of. People have liked. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the song. I can't even think of the name of the song. A Bond of Union, which is a mellow ballad, which I've never had on a a three album I've had like acoustic thing like uh, this letter the last one but and I was a little worried about that but you know I, this, it's silly what I justify things Greg Lake used to have some ballads on the song on the album so I'm gonna have one this time <laughs> right nice. like that means anything but <laughs> well I mean if it means something to you then it's worth meaning um I love that you mentioned the piano part I actually was getting like a Rick Wright vibe like a very understated jazzy you know he was very low-key always throwing in little nods to jazz like a Peterson or a Horace Silver or Monk. Yeah. Not the overplaying, but the underplaying. That was Rick's yeah. kind of thing. Uh, contrasting to Keith or Wakeman and guys like that. But um, yeah, man, I, I do feel like I, I, I definitely appreciate you going deep on that. And I, I do get the hopefulness and you've always been, like I said, uplifting overall. We all have our darkness and in our moments. I have been saying to my friends, and peers in the industry, regardless of, you know, what it is, if it's progressive rock or, you know, heavy metal, whatever it's going to be, when we come back to shows and tours, 
we're going to be like Vikings storming the beach. <laughs> like it's going to be nuts. They're going to buy all the merch. We're going to do all the autograph sessions. We're going to buy every beer. And, you know, like we're yeah. going to be a mess the first couple of shows back, but it's going to be the best kind of mess. I do believe we're going to get it back. I think it's just going to take time. We're going to work through this. It's happened before. It'll ha we'll get through it together. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, definitely. and maybe it's, it's some introspective. I mean, I don't want to do any more coronavirus songs for clients coming in. Like every time, <laughs> you know, I get anti Hillary songs, anti Trump songs, uh, Bernie song. I mean, because yeah, people, they write these things. And I've seen so many online that people say, hey, I got this song. I said, you know what? Nobody wants to hear that. Everybody and their brother is doing one online. But I think we're not going to get that with when concerts open again. We're going to get people doing the best of what they do and going to be so excited to be out there. I mean, musicians are dying, but look at the, the road crews, the lighting crews, sound company. They're dying on the vine more than the musicians, really. Um, cause they can't do anything. At least a musician can write and, you know, maybe put out an album, whatever, but the road crew guys for the first time, you're going to see them all with smiles. The road crew guys don't smile that much. They're always lifting equipment and painting and rigging and, but they're going to be happy. And that's going to be a whole different feel to the concert the real world. <laughs> right. Going to have, have even security is going to be happy for the first time. Ever. That's, that's and, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to be okay. Uh, I did see something really encouraging this week where even companies that are competitors were all banding together to volunteer the entire, you know, venue industry, basically the touring and venue industry offering themselves as vaccination sites. Yes. Uh, that's a brilliant idea on many fronts, get people back to work, open up more places to get vaccinated. And even again, cutting like AEG and Live Nation partnering up for whatever it's worth to do this positive good thing that is only for the good and not for a financial gain or anything. Right. And people can actually, you know, people can get back to work maybe even too. So that would be great. And uh, like I said, I am trying, music has been the saving grace. I'm sure it's been the saving grace for you. It has been oh, yeah. for me. It's been a blessing. And uh, I'm really appreciative to have this 3.2 record. If, if this is the final 3.2 record and you go onto something else under your own name or another band or a Christmas album for December people, right, right. <laughs> GTR squared or cubed whatever i would love to see it um i like that the world needs that you can keep that the first one's always free as a marketer that's what i do i give away the cool. free stuff and then i charge later but um yeah it's been <laughs> just um, amazing to hear from you robert thank you so much for sharing your story with ghost cult and it's just you know just always a pleasure to catch up with you man and i hopefully next time we'll be at one of those venues in person and we can talk more yeah I, you know I, I get up to napa once in a while you never know i might uh call you up and say hey we're at the charles krug okay. winery here come on down we'll do it we'll do it with the pinkies out and a little sip you, out. yeah right yeah exactly exact fancy exactly. not too fancy but a little fancy yeah um but yeah man be safe and take care of yourself thank you so much for this time i appreciate your time and thanks for listening to the album too i can tell you you cared about it and i really appreciate that